All right, today we're going to talk about Chapter 10, Alienation and Modification of Trust. First, let's discuss alienation of a beneficial interest. It refers to restrictions that are placed on a beneficiary's rights to transfer her interest in a trust. Now, these restrictions have many consequences, perhaps most importantly, are that they affect whether or not creditors can access the trust property. The beneficiary does not need to purposefully or voluntarily transfer their right to the creditor for this to matter. I want to do a quick review over the idea of title and property. The rights in this bundle can be separated and held by different parties. Like we do with trust, where the legal title is held by one party, which is the trustee. And the equitable title is held by the beneficiaries of the trust. An equitable title is the right to obtain full ownership of a property. Equitable, owner, uh, equitable title or equitable ownership is the right to obtain full ownership of the property. Whereas legal title is actual present ownership. And because we can split up the property rights, we can give somebody present legal title while giving somebody else equitable title. So I want you to all keep this in mind when we discuss creditors trying to reach trust property. Because the theories that justify the different rules we're gonna to discuss today sometimes center on the idea of who holds legal versus equitable title. Discus discretionary trusts are a type of trust that allow the trustee discretion or choice as to whether or not they distribute the trust income, or how much of it they distribute. So discretionary trusts give the trustee power to distribute, to decide whether or not to distribute, when to distribute, and how much to distribute. Now, there are different types of discretionary trusts, and they differ based on how much freedom they give the trustee to withhold these distributions or to decide when to give a distribution and how much to give. So a pure discretionary trust is when the trustee has absolute discretion over distributions to the beneficiary. So the trustee can decide how and when to provide distribution. Now, there are some protections for the beneficiary in this case, right? but it's going to be harder to show that a trustee breached his obligation to distribute in cases where there's a pure discretionary trust because the trustee has the most power. So in these cases, the creditor of a beneficiary has no recourse against the beneficiary's interest in the trust. So a creditor can't reach the property in the trust if it is a pure discretionary trust. 
Once it's distributed, it's no longer trust property. The legal title passes to the beneficiary. So then if anybody can reach trustee has legal title to the trust property. The beneficiary just has the right at some point in the future to have ownership of the property. But the beneficiary does not have the right to require the trustee to distribute the property. So courts say that in a case like this, the trustee really does have the title to the property. And so in a case like this, the creditor cannot take the legal title of the, of the trust property, cannot go into the trust to take the money. Now, if the trustee in this pure discretionary trust decides to transfer legal title to the beneficiary, then the creditor can still come after the beneficiary. But if the property stays in the trust, the creditor cannot reach it. The next type of discretionary trust is a support trust. Now here the trustee has some requirements to make distributions that are necessary for the beneficiary's needs. And usually this is where you see words like for comfort and support. Those are the common words used here. You probably have a support trust in that case. So support trusts are required to make distributions. Now, support trusts do insulate trust property from some but not all creditors. And this is under the common law. We're talking about the common law right now. What courts have found generally is that because the requirement for distributions are for needs, things that are necessary, then creditors that provide for the needs may be able to reach it. So they call them suppliers of necessities. Then there's a discretionary support trust. Discretionary support trust is a trust that tries to combine absolute discretion with some type of distribution standard. They're generally treated like pure discretionary trusts. about what the modern trend is as far as discretionary trusts are concerned. The modern trend is, as far as creditors are concerned, to abolish the differences between the discretionary and the support trust. Okay, the modern trend in both the restatement, the third restatement and the UTC is to abolish the differences between uh, the discretionary and support trust. So we're gonna go over the UTC approach and then we'll talk about how the third restatement differs, third restatement of trust differs from the UTC. The UTC approach, which is reprinted here, is closer to the traditional approach or the common law approach than the restatement, the third restatement on trust. 
And it's closer to the traditional rule because the creditor can't reach the beneficiary's interest if the trustee has discretion to decide whether or not the beneficiary gets a distribution. So a creditor cannot reach the beneficiary's interest if the trustee has true discretion over whether or not the beneficiary gets a distribution. This is true even if the beneficiary is permitted to compel the trustee to make a distribution. Even if the beneficiary has the right to compel the trustee to distribute some property, it does not mean that the creditor can compel for a distribution. So it's similar to the traditional rule because in both cases, the creditor cannot reach the beneficiary's interest if it's uh, if the trustee decides, has complete discretion to decide whether or not to distribute the property, and of course decides not to distribute it. But the UTC takes it a little bit further and says that this is true regardless of whether or not the beneficiary has the right to compel a distribution. The creditor does not get those rights. It differs from the traditional law also because there is no exception for creditors providing basic necessities or suppliers of necessities. Those creditors cannot reach discretionary trusts under the UTC, even if they are support trusts, which, as we said, support trusts and pure discretionary trusts under the UTC have been combined, the rules that apply to them as far as creditors go have been combined, okay? So just to restate, the UTC does not allow creditors to reach the beneficiary's interest if the trustee has discretion whether or not to distribute the property. There are some exceptions to this rule, and they are listed here for a beneficiary's child, spouse, or former spouse. Alimony payments, payments of child support. And if it at all helps you to remember this rule or the justification for it, you can go back to this diagram here and see that in the in the views of the person that drafted the UTC, the reasons why they are making it so creditors cannot go after the trust property is because they say, well, the trustee really has legal title. And the beneficiary does not get to dictate when they get the trust property. So all they have is equitable title and you can't attach to equitable title. That is the argument, at least. If that doesn't make sense to you, then just let it float out of your brain. If it does and it's helpful for you to remember the rule, then go ahead and write it down. Now, the, third rest the restatement third of trusts takes a different view from the UTC. And it holds that a creditor of a beneficiary can reach any distribution to a beneficiary. Restatement third of trust takes a different view and it holds that a creditor of a beneficiary can reach any distribution of the beneficiary. Any di the restatement takes a controversial position because it allows for the creditor to compel the trustee and then take any distribution that the beneficiary could have taken. 
So for any discretionary trust, the creditor or the beneficiary under the restatement rules can attach any distribution that the beneficiary could have compelled. Compel the trustee to distribute it, maybe. Maybe they were supposed to get it normally and haven't been getting it normally. Um, they can compel a trustee to do that. And the re so we said under the UTC, the creditor can't force the beneficiary to compel the trust to pay them out. Whereas for the restatement, it actually allows the creditor to step in the shoes of the beneficiary and compel the trust to pay the creditor as they would have the beneficiary. It's pretty controversial. It's my understanding that states have not enacted the, many states have not included this uh, in their statutes, and some states have actually passed statutes saying that they don't agree with this restatement rule. Does this trust? Creditors for torts can't reach. They are not one of the creditors that are included in the exemptions to this, or exceptions to this rule. So you see child, spouse, former spouse, but you don't see any beneficiaries of an intentional tort claim that may be trying to satisfy that claim from a trust. And there was an example, a very moving example in your book about cases that occur um, that can't reach monies and trusts. Okay, Spendthrift Trusts. So Spendthrift Trusts are trusts where a settler has placed a restraint preventing the beneficiary from transferring her interest in the trust. It doesn't have to be called a Spendthrift Trust. In other words, what I'm saying is you will have to look to see if something is a spendthrift trust. It might just have a provision, a spendthrift provision in it. Now, spendthrift trusts apply to the restrictions that are placed, apply to both voluntary and involuntary transfers. And we already discussed a little bit what that, the difference between the two of them would be. If there is a spend thrift clause, it explicitly states that usually that creditors of the beneficiary cannot attach property until after it is distributed. So you might be thinking, hmm, how does that really differ from the creditor rules on discretionary trust? Discretionary trusts are subject to something called a Hamilton order. Hamilton order. A Hamilton order is a court order that prevents trusts from making payments to a beneficiary or another party for the benefit of that beneficiary. Again, a Hamilton order is a court order that prevents a discretionary trust from making payments to the beneficiary or to another party for the benefit of the beneficiary. The Hamilton order instead directs the trustee to make those payments to the beneficiary's creditors. The Hamilton order directs the trustee to make the payments instead to the beneficiary's creditors. 
Those apply to discretionary trusts. A Hamilton order applies to discretionary trusts. If a trustee of a discretionary trust gets a Hamilton order, they must stop making payments to the beneficiary when they distribute. Instead, they distribute that payment to the creditor of the beneficiary. So they pay the creditor directly. Now, if there is a spendthrift provision or a spendthrift trust, however, the creditor is prohibited from attaching the property using a Hamilton order. So since the creditor is prohibited from using a Hamilton order, the only only redress that the creditor has is to attach the property once the legal title has moved to the beneficiary, once it's been distributed. So for our purposes, when we say that trust property is distributed, what we mean is the legal title to that property goes to the beneficiary. Now we, you know, it could be cash, so we don't really think of it as property, but it is cash is. Now, these provisions are useful because instead of distributing to a beneficiary, a trustee can support the beneficiary by paying for the beneficiary's expenses directly to the provider of health care, the landlord, they can pay the university. They just can't distribute the property to the beneficiary. They can't make the distributions to the beneficiary, but spendthrift provisions allow them to make payments for the benefit of the beneficiary to a third party. If there is a spendthrift provision, the creditor cannot obtain a Hamilton order. And we said a Hamilton order prevents the trust from making payments to either the beneficiary or a third party for the benefit of the beneficiary. That third party could be a healthcare provider, a hospital, a landlord, a university. Instead, the Hamilton order directs the trustee to pay the creditor of the beneficiary directly what they would have paid the university, et cetera, et cetera. If there's a spendthrift provision, then the creditor can't get a Hamilton order. So the only way they can satisfy the debt is to wait to see if the trustee distributes property to the beneficiary or cash to the beneficiary. But, and then you, once the beneficiary gets the title, then of course, a creditor can get to it. The reason that we have issues right now about whether or not the creditor can get to it is we've split up legal versus equitable ownership. So once legal and equitable title are with the beneficiary, the creditor can reach it. There's no question of that. The question is, when legal title is held by a trustee, for the benefit of a beneficiary, can a creditor reach it? When can a creditor reach it? Exceptions to the spendthrift provisions that we just discussed. The UTC provides that spendthrift provisions are not enforceable against children, spouses, or former spouses for support or maintenance. So again, we're talking child support or alimony. And there are some additional protections, like for a judgment creditor who's provided services for the protection of a beneficiary's interest in a trust, which is usually an attorney that is owed attorney fees. This is an example of a spendthrift provision. And you know it's a spendthrift provision because it doesn't allow assignment for payment of any debt. Remember this case? It had to do with a child being sexually molested. Kruger sexually assaulted Schiffel's minor child videotaped the act and then broadcast the video over the internet. 
and he was found criminally liable, and they sued him in civil court to get a civil judgment, which they did get, a $551,286.25. The court in this case upheld the spend breath clause and did not allow Schiphol to reach the money that was in Kroger's trust. And again, it was because, as I noted, the exceptions that apply that allow spouses and children to make claims against Spendthrift Trust don't apply to persons who are creditors in the sense that they have a judgment for an intentional tort. So a judgment for an intentional tort still cannot reach a Spendthrift Trust. About creditors of a settler when a settler is a beneficiary. So this can happen if it's a revocable trust. It can also happen if it's an irrevocable trust for which the settler is also a beneficiary. The way this could be written is that the settler would be the beneficiary or have a life estate in a property, for example, while he's alive. He would have an interest in the property while he's alive, and then it would pass to another set of beneficiaries. Spendthrift provisions are not valid if the settler is a beneficiary. They consider it merely shifting the settler's asset from one pocket to another in an attempt to avoid creditors. Except in states that have something called a self-settled asset protection trust. It is a new type of trust that is statutory. It is based on statutes that are enacted in these states. And it allows settlers to put spendthrift provisions into trusts for which they are the beneficiary. Settler wants to make changes to a revocable trust or if they want to terminate a trust. What happens? How do they do that? The settler can do whatever the settler wants with a revocable trust because they have maintained their control in almost all cases. But if the trust instrument doesn't say anything or it does what it normally does and generally allows all modifications by the settler, then the seller can modify. There are no restrictions against that for revocable trusts. Irrevocable trusts. Let's say the settler is alive and the settler agrees to the modification of the irrevocable trust and all the beneficiaries agree. Notice the trustee does not have to agree. The trustee it doesn't matter what the trustee thinks, as long as the settler and all beneficiaries consent. Then the settler plus all the beneficiaries may modify or terminate the trust. Okay? Straightforward. Because if you think about it, the trustee's purpose is to to try to protect the intent of the settler. If the settler is saying change, it doesn't matter if the trustee doesn't agree to the change. Okay. Let's say the settler doesn't, con uh, doesn't consent, or I put, in, I put in parentheses, can't consent. Now, the settler doesn't consent, but all the beneficiaries agree. And the trustee objects. Under the common law courts would apply something called the Claflin Doctrine, which I accidentally cut out of your reading, so listen. <laughs> or if you don't understand what I'm about to tell you, go back and find this word in your reading and read that little paragraph. The Claflin Doctrine says that if there is consent of all of the beneficiaries, 
and the modification is not contrary to the material purpose of the settler, then a modification is allowed or a termination. So what is the material purpose? It is very, very fact sensitive. It depends on the facts of the case. Certain trusts though will be considered to continue to have a material purpose as long as they continue to exist meaning as long as the trust instrument does not terminate, call for termination, or the principal has not been exhausted. How does a trust terminate? A trust terminates if, when the trust instrument says so or when the trust runs out of principal because there's nothing left. And, but let's say we want to terminate it or modify it in other circumstances. That's when this applies. If a trust is a spendthrift trust, a support trust, a discretionary trust, or any trust where property is not distributed until a certain age, then courts will always find that that kind of trust has an unfulfilled material purpose. because if its purpose is to continue, so for example, for a discretionary trust, for a purely discretionary trust, the trust purpose is to provide distributions to the beneficiaries, let's say, it will continue to have a purpose. Its material purpose is to provide these distributions, which it will continually have the purpose to do until it runs out of trust principle. So the spendthrift trust, support trust, discretionary trust, or trusts where property is not distributed until a certain age are considered to have a unfulfilled material purpose. Courts will generally find that. So the Claflin Doctrine has been reformed in the UTC and in the third restatement third on trust. The way that they have tried to reform it differed. They both have something in common though, and that's that they both allow for termination even if you have the unfilled material purpose. So that's how they differ from the traditional rule. They both allow for termination even if you have the unfulfilled material purpose. The UTC preserves the material purpose rule from the traditional law, but it allows for less than beneficiaries unanimity. So if you remember to the previous slide, we said that there must no longer be a material purpose and all beneficiaries must consent. The UTC weakens that requirement And it also authorizes termination if the interests of absent beneficiaries will be adequately protected. And absent beneficiaries could be beneficiaries that have not been born yet. So the restatement weakens the material purpose rule and authorizes termination as long as the court figures that the reasons for terminating or modifying outweigh the material purpose. But it does require beneficiaries' unanimity. Settler does not consent to modification or termination. All beneficiaries agree, but the trustee objects. 
You can apply the Claflin Doctrine or you can apply the Equitable Deviation Doctrine. However, the equitable deviation doctrine at common law, courts prefer to apply it only to modifications for administrative purposes. As opposed to modifications on terms of distributions or something more substantive. And it holds that even if the tests, you know, the trustee, <laughs> almost did it again. Even if the trustee objects, if there are unforeseen circumstances that the settler couldn't foresee, right? Unforeseen circumstances that defeat or substantially impair the ability to accomplish the purpose of the trust. then the court may allow for the modification of that trust. Again, more so for administrative modifications. The UTC and third restatement allows for deviations if it furthers the purpose of the trust. And here is the UTC rule. The court may modify the administrative or dispositive terms of a trust. So it extends it to not only administrative. Because of circumstances not anticipated by the settler, To the extent practical, the modification must be made in accordance with the settler's probable intention. For administrative terms, the court needs to find that existing terms are impracticable or wasteful or impair the trust administration. And if they're terminating the trust, then they have to distribute the property in accordance with the trust purposes. Trustee removal. Trustee removal is a remedy. It's not a modification. Traditional, under traditional law, removal of a trustee could only be done for cause. So the trustee had to do something pretty egregious to be removed. They had to do some serious breach of the trust or be unfit to serve. There were pretty high bars for removal. The reasons courts gave was that the the settler picked the trustee and they wanted to honor his or her wishes. They did not want to give beneficiaries the power to remove the trustee that the settler picked. The UTC codifies this, but it also adds some subsections that allows for removal for not as serious circumstances. And I reprinted it here. So this is UTC subsection 706. This is the 2000 version. It says the court may remove a trustee if, of course, the first subsection 1B1 is the common law if they've committed a serious breach. Subsection 2 is the same as the common law. That's where it's substantially, they're substantially impaired. But 3 and 4 are new or different than the common law. If the trustee is unfit, unwilling, or demonstrates a persistent failure to administer the trust effectively, 
then they can be removed. Or if there has been a substantial change of circumstances, or the removal is requested by all of the qualified beneficiaries. The court would also, in that case, need to find that the removal of the trustee best serves the interests of the beneficiaries, and it's not inconsistent with the material purpose of the trust. Davis v. U.S. Bank is a case in which the beneficiaries wanted to change the trustee. Now, I want you to pay attention to this case for the idea of virtual representation. Remember that when you have an irrevocable trust that goes on and continues for long periods of time, oftentimes it does so because it is benefiting a class of beneficiaries. And sometimes, or oftentimes, that class remains open, meaning more members can join if they are, I don't know, born. So if beneficiaries want to ask for a trustee to be removed under the rules, they all need to consent. Well, what about the beneficiaries that are not yet in existence? Or the beneficiaries that are too young to make a decision? Like minors. This case grapples with whether or not those minors need to have a separate appointed guardian ad litem to represent their interests. Or it offers another option which is virtual representation. Now, virtual representation does not mean that there's representation using virtual reality or anything to do with technology, okay? Virtual representation is if the interests of the minors are virtually the same as the interests of a beneficiary in the class that's an adult, then that adult can speak for the interests of the minors and any class members that are unborn or potential class members. That is what virtual representation is. Okay? So if you have a question that, has, that requires you to get beneficiaries' consent, you need to think about whether or not there are persons that might join the class later and whether or not you need to get their consent and how you can have them represented in some way in the decision-making process. Virtual representation gives you that option. 